There's another leftmost derivation, a different one. For one thing, it starts with BC instead of AB. So whichever way you chose here, it would have worked, as long as you managed to continue correctly later. What does that tell you about this grammar? What's it called? What kind of a grammar is it? It's ambiguous because there's a string, I exhibited one for you, that has two leftmost derivations. That's an ambiguous grammar. The trees for these two would look different. Right? Ambiguous grammars are bad for parsers. They don't know what to do at any given step. And you would try to fix this grammar, if you could, to an unambiguous one that accepted the same language. But we're not talking about that right now. I'm talking just about understanding the parsing mechanism and the fact that there are choices here and the fact that I could have made this grammar harder so that the wrong choice, so that this actually would not have been able to get to the end here. We would have gotten stuck. We would have gotten up to a certain point where we said, oh, we can't do it. And in fact, in Chomsky normal form, you can count how many steps it takes to get here. There better be the same number of steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Same number of steps every time. It's always twice the length of the string minus one. Okay, now why is that? It's because every time you try to get a string, there's got to be five steps that substitute capital letters for these things at some point. That's five. That's the length of the string. And then you've got to be able to get the capital letters in there to substitute for. You're starting with a single capital letter. Every time you use one of these double Chomsky normal form productions, you add an extra letter. So you're going to add four extra capital letters, so there get to be five extra capital letters. So that's n plus n minus 1, that's 2n minus 1, or nine steps. It's always nine steps. Chomsky normal form grammars are very easy to control. Okay, they're like in a straitjacket. They all work in a very specific way. So since there's only nine levels to get to here, and at most two productions on a shot, worst case, we could do two to the ninth things and just try all the trees and figure out whether we could actually generate this string or not. And that's like a brute force, horrible membership test algorithm. But we could do it. We wouldn't have to try everything forever. And in this case, we would have found at least these two different parse trees that, that accept. All right, questions so far? So what we're going to try to do, we did this in our heads. We kind of saw how it was done. It was kind of ad hoc. We're going to try to build a non-deterministic pushdown machine that has the power to do exactly this, this or this. That it can simulate what we did, whatever choices we made. Now, you can definitely write a program to do this. We just described one, you, one that actually builds these trees and tries them all. But we want to build a non-deterministic program to do it that only has one stack, a pushdown machine. And the mechanism to do it won't be, won't be very complicated once you get started. And I think we can put it over here. Every time this grammar generates a symbol, the machine's going to read that symbol. All these capital letters that sit there waiting to be looked at and substituted for, where is our machine going to store those? Store them on the stack. And it's a nice lucky thing that we're storing them on a stack because that's exactly the data structure that's appropriate for these terminals in the sense that C gets thrown on the stack, then B gets thrown on the stack. And what's the next thing that you look at to substitute for? The B, the left one. So the last thing that got thrown in is the first thing to be pulled out and get substituted for. So it's very natural to use a stack. Just think of the machine as taking these non-terminals, chucking them upside down into the stack, and the terminal symbols that you're substituting for, that's reading them on the tape. So let's be very specific and actually do it. The machine is not too complicated to write. We'll write it over here. The chalk is dustless because it has no integrity. <laughs> All right. Here's what we do. We don't read any symbol to start. There's an empty symbol on the stack. And what do we put on the stack to start off? A, or the start symbol. That's what we're going to substitute for at the beginning. Don't read any symbol. Just remember that there's a start symbol that needs to be substituted for. So A, Z. And then you go to the huge processing state. There's only three states in this whole machine. Now. At any point along the way, say at this point, the machine would have already read the symbols 1, 0, and now it's looking to substitute for A. 
Let's write all the possible things that we might do in substituting for a. We might take a off the stack and replace it with bc. We might take a off the stack and replace it with ab. Now let's actually do that technically and, and specifically. Let's give the machine the possibility of choosing this or this. We don't care whether this is the right one or that's the right one. The machine's got to have the ability to do everything that you tried to do and everything that I tried to do. It's got to be able to do this or that. So it's got to be able to do all these things. All right, how do you take A off and put two new things on? It looks like this. And by the way, on what symbol are you reading when you do this? Are you reading any symbols? Are you generating any symbols in this grammar? <coughs> Nothing. You're just looking at the stack and making substitutions. You do not move along the symbols at all. You don't generate any ones or zeros. So here's what we do. On an empty string, if there is an A on the stack, what do you do with it? BC. Right, you want to put BC on, but, but unfortunately our machine is too crippled to do this all in one step. Uh, so we first pop it off, right? Then what do we do? Doesn't matter what's on the stack now. Looking at nothing, no matter what's on the stack, we have to push on BC. What do we push first? Right, we need to push these things in reverse order, meaning not left to right, but right to left. First push in C, so that goes down, and then be on top of it, so that the next thing we look at is the left end. That's very natural. I mean, we, we want to push it in that way. C goes in first, B later, so that the next thing we look at is the leftmost symbol. So we push C on top of anything, we go to another state, and we finally come back, and we push, well, it's going to be C, we're going to push B on top of that. Oh. I did say the machine only has three states. I did. You mean like three stakes? I feel like I'm in court. <laughs> Did, <laughs> Did it? It's just the worst thing. It's just like, didn't you say that you were thinking about your class when you were coming to that intersection? So how could you have been concentrating on the truck that was coming on the wrong side? I said I was thinking about, no, I meant, no. Michael's got a good question. I meant three important states. <laughs> the start state, the processing state, and then the final state. It's true, but I think of these as technical states. And actually, all the other loops that we're going to do, I'm going to stop writing these states. I'm just going to say, you like, push BC on. But you're right. You're right. It's technically not three states, and it could be much more. And thank you. Um, these are just technicalities. Our machine can't do a pop and a double push in one step. It's got to do it in you know, one, two, three steps. So I just want to show you you can do that stuff. You probably knew it already, popping and pushing twice. You can do it in one step. Well, one conceptual step. All right. But just like I said, instead of writing all these things complicated on the board, let's make another loop that represents another you know, two extra states that gives us the other choice. This is a conceptual loop, so I'll just put a green arrow. It should look more like that. And what do we do here? Didn't you say it had three states? <laughs> what am I doing here in this one? Pop off A and push on. Right, so I'm going to say pop A, push B, push A. All right. That's it for A, right? Those are the only things you can do if you see an A on the stack, except for that. Sometimes we don't want to expand the A. Sometimes we just want to turn the A into a 1. Did we ever do that? Sure. Right here we did it, right? How does the machine do that? How does the machine simulate that? For the first time, the machine will actually read a symbol. It'll say, if I see a 1 on the tape, then I can take that 